racial mixing um, and and misconceptions for kind of anti or even me like I'll probably bring in like African American um, like I grew up too okay so it's just 11.50 okay okay um, thank you if you want me to give you a uh, five yeah, yeah that'd be great thank you Good morning. My name is Gaston Alonso, and I am the director of the Ethel R. Wolf Institute for the Humanities at Brooklyn College. I am very honored and excited to welcome you to today's event. Anti-blackness, anti-blackness and myths of racial mixing and mestizaje. A conversation with Tania Gregory Hernandez, the Archibald R. Mary Professor of Law at Fordham University School of Law. Jasmine Mitchell, Associate Professor of Puerto Rican and Latinx Studies at Brooklyn College, City University of New York, and Paul Ortiz, Professor of History and Director of the Samuel Proctor Oral History Program at the University of Florida, who is joining us on screen from Florida today, and who is Brooklyn College's 2023-24 Best Scholar in Residence. Please help me welcome them with a round of applause. 
before we start, just a few quick announcements. First, today's event is a preview for what will be going on right here at the Tanger Auditorium during the first week of April. From April 1st to April 4th, the Wolf Institute will be hosting a series of eight public events organized to honor the work of Paul Ortiz. We call it Hess Week. 25 speakers, eight events, four days. Important discussions about academic freedom, the crisis of democracy, the role of movement solidarity, and oral history in defending our freedoms and our democratic practices. At the door, you receive a schedule of all of the events. Please join us that week. Second, if you are not already done so, please follow the Wolf Institute on social media to learn about our upcoming events. The links are in the program. Third, if you're a student and you did not sign in on the way in, please make sure that you sign in on the way out. And fourth, this event is being live streamed and we're recording it and it will be housed on the Wolf Institute YouTube channel. Now it is Brooklyn College, our technologies lag sometimes, so there's a slight echo. Bear with us. Uh, <laughs> we're trying our best. Uh, and fifth, and importantly, after the event, we'll be giving away uh, for students books by Professor Hernandez and Professor Ortiz. So hold on, and then come on up after the event. And with that, let me introduce my colleague from the Puerto Department of Puerto Rican and Latino Studies, uh, the chair of the department, Alan Aja. Thank you, Dr. Alonso. We'll be quick. Como estamos, mi gente? How we doing? Yeah. yeah, nice to see you here today. I do got to do a quick plug. Um, for those of you who are graduating, felicidades. You got this, right? For those who are back next semester, uh, given what we're going to discuss and learn today together, we also extend that through many of our courses in Pearl, right? So if, you're, if you want to continue and you need those gen ed or pathways courses, or you're thinking about a major, a minor, and so forth, consider that we're offering Latin America next semester with Dr. Mitchell, who's right here, right? Um, also, um, you got in, the intro to Pearl, the Latinx diasporas. Also, the following spring, we'll be off offering racial linguistics with Professor Mena and a course on banned books by, by Dr. Espana, which was just, just approved. So consider those, if you have more questions, right here. Uh, gracias, and gracias for having us. Thank you. And with that, let me quickly thank our sponsors for today's event, the Robert L. Hess Memorial Fund and the Department of Puerto Rican and Latinx Studies, in cooperation with the Departments of Africana Studies, English, Political Science, Philosophy, and Sociology, and the Africana Research Center at Brooklyn College. Thank you all for your support in bringing us together today. And now we are in for a tweet, an urgently important conversation about anti-black racism in the Americas. Let me quickly introduce the speakers, though their full biographies are in the program. Tania Kerry Hernandez is the Archibald R. Mary Professor of Law at Fordham University School of Law, where she's also the Associate Director of the Center for Race, Law, and Justice. Her books include Racial Subordination in Latin America, The Role of the State, Customary Law, and New Civil Rights Responses, which also has Spanish and Portuguese editions, The Brill Research Perspective in Comparative Law, Racial Discrimination, Multiracials and Civil Rights, Mixed Race Stories of Discrimination, and Racial Innocence, Unmasking Latino and Anti-Black Bias, and the Struggle for Equality, copies of which again will be given out at the end of the event. Now earlier this academic year, Dr. Jackson Mitchell joined Brooklyn College and the Department of Puerto Rican and Latinx Studies as an associate professor. She's the author of Imagining the Mulata Blackness in the U.S. and Brazilian Media, and her scholarship has been featured in wide-ranging academic and popular outlets from comparative migration studies and social sciences to Newsweek and The Hill. Now, Paul Ortiz was joining us in Florida, where I hope the weather is better than here. Mm -hmm. uh, as I mentioned, is professor of history and the director of the Samuel Proctor Oral History Program at the University of Florida. He's the author of several books, including An African-American and Latinx History of the United States, copies of which will also be given away at the end of the event. And Emancipation Betrayed, The Hidden History of Black Organizing and White Violence in Florida, From Reconstruction to the Bloody Election of 1920. He's co-editor of People Power, History, Organizing, and Larry Gutwin's 
Democratic Vision in the 21st Century, which I just finished reading and highly recommend. Um, and remember Jim Crow, African Americans tell about life in the segregated South. Professor Ortiz is also the past president of United Faculty of Florida, UF, FEA, AFL, CIO, the union that represents tenure and non tenure track faculty at the University of Florida and has been fighting for academic freedom. Of course, he is also Brooklyn College's best scholar in residence this year and will be in this room, right, at 11 a.m. on Monday, April 1st. And so with that, let me turn the microphone over to Professor Daphne Mitchell, who will lead us in conversation. Thank you so much for being with us. Great, thank you. Okay. All right, I am so excited to um, be in conversation with you and Paul today uh, to discuss this really, I think, timely issue that has deep historical roots. But to start off our conversation today, I'd love to hear more of your thoughts on what is this myth of racial mixing and the elimination of racism? And can you talk a little bit about how it operates in different communities and nations? Well, I think to best sort of put into context in, from a Latin America perspective, mm -hmm. specifically, this idea of racial mixing, we also have to think of a particular moment in time. Right? Uh, that is to say, slavery has been abolished slowly but surely across the Americas, Brazil the last in 1888, but nevertheless, slowly but surely, right, we have slavery being abolished across the Americas. Uh, and at that point in time, you have then the ascendancy of eugenics, right? these ideas that uh, racial supremacy uh, based on one's genetic profile, right? that some genes are better than other genes in the DNA pool, and that genes themselves are what make us a race as opposed to a social construct. Anyway, so the rise of eugenics. So we have across Latin America uh, a very dark <laughs> a vision right, of, of its populations. And so part of the modernization project uh, after abolition is this recasting of what the skin shades mean. And part of the mythology that's used to sort of combat stories of eugenics, right? If you are trying to navigate European powers at the United States and its imperialism and what have you, the idea is, well, we can't say we're white like Europe, though we do have white people, right? at least white presenting, and many white identifying. How do we explain the rest of these people? Because otherwise our nation looks backwards. And hence begins this idea of, oh, we have many different shades, but the shades are all going to one goal. And the goal is that we will be so mixed, and this is Vasconcelos uh, uh, from Mexico with his um, uh, philosophical thoughts about the superiority of the project of racial mixing, uh, and then eventually Gilberto Freire in mm -hmm. Brazil and what have you, um, such that we will mix away our blackness. We will diminish our indigenous ancestry because, you know, white genes are so powerful they're going to knock out everything else. And so, could you hold the microphone? Sure. Thank you so much. We'll just pass it back and forth then. OK. Um, so yes, the idea is we'll mix away all the backwardness. Uh, and yeah, you, there'll be still maybe a little tinge here and there, but, but it'll be like a new whitish. And this new whitish right, is going to be even better right, than what they've got in Europe, right? uh, because we've got some of the you know, strengths of our indigenous ancestry. We'll leave them behind the black stuff. Uh, and so this will make us even better. Right? So it's all a narrative um, of sort of, if you will, uh, will a nation building, self-esteem boosting uh, a way to characterize the nations in the advent of eugenics, saying, oh no, if you go to all these colored people, you can't possibly be a civilized advanced nation. Right? Okay. Um, so the, that's sort of some of the historic origins. Now, the you, what you may be more familiar with, perhaps, right, um, if you are you know, Latino studies, Latin American studies, um, 
interested uh, and literate uh, student population uh, is the idea of ansaldúas, right? You know, this feminist sort of reimagining of the beauty of racial mixing as a source of strength, as a source of many intellectual and sort of even spiritual sort of sustaining um, roots. However, and Asandua sort of, you know, credits La Raza Cosmica, the, the cosmic race of, of, of Las Concelos uh, that I mentioned earlier, as sort of like the, the build out. The problem uh, with some of this, though, is that Asandua sort of, kind of skips over <laughs> some of the horribleness of Las Concelos in that his idea of racial mixing, right, as I said earlier, right, was to get rid of the bad stuff. And he's very explicit in his writings about blackness in particular, and calling it a degenerate right, uh, source of the mixing. Right? So I mean, we really want to quickly get rid of this. And so this idea of um, racial mixing as a source of uh, both utopia right, uh, and symbolic of racial harmony is a very narrow look at it in the light of its um, use for racial violence. And so the idea is like there's a hierarchy, and the lower you are on the hierarchy with blackness at the bottom, right, the more than your, bo your bodies are dispensable. Because you know, we we're mixing with a gold. We're not just mixing. Right? Um, and we're viewing mixing as appropriate across a particular socioeconomic strata, right? That is to say, upper elite whites don't favor this mixing. It's all right for y'all at the bottom, right? uh, but there still needs to be a whiteness that is pure. Right? Um, and even if you know a European might not view Latin American whiteness as the same, internally, we view it as a, a powerful. Right? Um, and so when you think about these origins of um, Latin American uh, mestizaje, the other thing to consider is that, yes, it differs across the region. I mean, um, Jean Rayer is an anthropologist at FIU, uh, Florida International University. In any case, he focuses particularly on Ecuador, right? But this also applies to Mexico and some other places in Central America. That is to say, that mestizaje has a different kind of rhetoric. He calls it a monocultural mestizaje, racial mixture. That is to say, Ecuador, Mexico, they talk about mixing, right? But they only focus on two roots, right? European and indigenous. Overlooking what they say in Mexico now, where they've got a little bit of a weight, oh, they become a little more weight too <laughs> over the years. La tercera raíz, the third root, right? that is to say, their African ancestry, right? which is mystifying for many people in Mexico as well, because there's been concerted projects to erase that, not only to erase the people, but to erase the historical uh, presence. Colonial period in Latin America, Spanish colonial period, at one point in time, Mexico was the concentrated space, right? They had the densest population of African slaves in the Americas right? during the col Spanish colonial period. Right? That changes over time. But I just sort of take out that one little factoid as a way to sort of dispel this idea, oh no, not here, not like the US, etc. When in point of fact, right, historians sort of have been becoming more and more precise about the ways in which 90%, 90%, 90 of the African slave trade brought, forcibly brought Africans to Latin America and the Caribbean. Caribbean across linguistics. <laughs> but that region, as opposed to 3.5%, 3.5% to what we now call the United States. Right? So that's another way of saying that the legacy of slavery and its rhetorics, meaning the uh, notion of racial hierarchy that's imbued into trying to justify uh, the slave trade is very much a Latin American a legacy as it is a U.S. one. Yeah. And thank you for that and giving the historical context. And I always find it so interesting that this idea of racial mixing is thought of in the future, right? That in the future, and in 
across the Americas, right, really, that the idea of progress, right, becomes tied to this idea of racial mixing, right, will remove the stain, right, on this idea of the stain of blackness, right, itself, right, so that we can eventually become modern, and right, said, or, right, in the U.S., right, we won't have racism at all. And I find it interesting, this comparison between the U.S. and Latin America, right, where the U.S. becomes like, oh yeah, you know, we have Jim Crow, we had Jim Crow here, and we didn't have racial mixing, right? So I was like, whoa, what did you, what did you call colonization? Right? And enslavement, that's, that's, that was racial mixing, right? So this idea in the U.S. that racial mixing is something new, okay, that will make us uh, more progressive, Okay. We'll eliminate racism, so we don't need to talk about race at all. And, well, why don't we look at Latin America and see how that turned out? <laughs> Let's look at and see how that turned out for them. So what I find um, really crucial right, is to do this comparison and also to think of how the U.S. and Latin America have been used as foils right, for each other. Right? So that the U.S. Right, in the eyes of Latin America often become well, that's the country that's racist, right? And actually to even talk about race is racist. So those policies, right, like affirmative action, right, that they have in the U.S., that's gonna bring U.S. style racism, right, to Latin America, right? It's gonna bring more problems here because we never had a race problem, right? Because we don't have race, right? We're racially mixed, right? At the same time, when, and just as you mentioned, right, when you look at the hierarchies, right, the upper class, that's, that's white, right? That is white, white, right? And they know, right? So maybe they're not, right, the European white, right? But it remains right, very much entrenched within these hierarchies of whiteness, right? And then racial mixing becomes the supposed identity, right, of the country, yet the racial, social, economic, political hierarchies remain the same. So that, okay, there's, often an identification toward whiteness, okay? or almost an aspirational whiteness, okay? because whiteness is always thought of as prettier, right? more beautiful, more intelligent, unless except for the ways in which blackness gets used as this idea of hybrid vigor. Okay? So the Brazilian soccer team, okay? oh, well, they're so good because they have the um, they have the blackness, right? The athleticism, right? Of, of the black bodies, right? With the you know white intelligence and strategy, okay? and I think that we actually also have similar kinds of discourses here in the U.S. Right? That often the U.S. and Latin America are thought of as they're so different from each other. They're like, oh, well, they're not really different, right? Really, it's, it's anti-blackness, right? At its root, it's just we have slightly different uh, ways, right, of talking about anti-blackness and ways of thinking about how racial mixing is going to get us to the future, right? The only difference perhaps in the U.S. is that we're thinking of racial mixing as something new, right? When it's not new at all, right? It's as old as the U.S. itself. And so, um, so having said that, I'd love to hear more about how racial mixing, right, also um, coincides with these myths of colorblindness, right? What are some of these myths of of colorblindness, right, that circulate? Well, to put it just simply, what colorblindness does is it then sets up a scenario in which bringing up race, raising the issues, is itself racism. Mm -hmm. So you, 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 you speak race, boom, you are the racist in the room. Mm -hmm. It also then, erases systems and structures and institutions. That is to say, if racism is only when people talk race right, or say that they racially identify or view some kind of racial patterns that they view problematic, that then means that if you call all that the only thing that's racism and refuse to acknowledge the issue of, well, this thing you say is only about poverty. But, you know, to go back to what you mentioned earlier, Dr. Mitchell, right? This idea of, oh, 
whites at the top, right? not concerning themselves with those on the bottom, if that's brought to them as a race dynamic, and I've dealt with this a lot, right? uh, what the response is, it's not about race. It's about class, socioeconomic status, right? So that everything that you see here that, you know, oh, yes, it's a problem. Poverty, it probably is a problem. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, when people, when they become educated, we won't invest in the public school system, but when they become educated and get better jobs, we won't open up the labor market to them. But when they get better jobs, then this will all be resolved, right? Our poverty issue that looks like a color spectrum that, you know, that will be resolved. Now, what this doesn't engage because of rhetorics of colorblindness, right? If you remove the analytical lens of race, then you can't name what the patterns actually mean. Right? So it's not just a coincidence right, that the socioeconomic hierarchy is very significantly a race color spectrum. Right? If it were not about race, well then we should be able to see all the different colors and all the different spaces. Right? Uh, if you don't, like if you believe in capitalism and there should be a top and a middle and a bottom, right? you could have capital. I mean, in the abstract, one could perceive right, that there would be a capitalism that have racial mixture and integration and diversity, et cetera, that you don't suggest that there's something more nefarious going on. And certainly, historically, we see those levers right, uh, being uh, utilized. But colorblindness takes that off the table for even an analytical lens. Right? So like the social scientists in the room, right? If you aren't able to use race as a variable, then that means that you're not able to show the ways in which, ah, people with the same college degree, and this is just a little statistical fact to bring out from Latin America, right? and it's a US one as well. People with the same college degree, the same training in the same topic, if they are black and if they are white, they don't get the same, as an economist would say, return on their investment. What that means is you can't get the same jobs. Same college degree. So it's not about education. It's not about uh, you know the ways in which you're not ready. You know, it's unfortunate. But when you get ready, then we'll be able to like give you what you need. No. If you compare across the same status, economically, educationally, et cetera, and you use race as a variable, then you're able to see the work that race does. If you take race off as a variable, then all you have is, oh, well, you know, some people do okay with their degree and some other people don't do okay with their degree. I guess they're just not working as hard. That's the evil of colorblindness. Thanks. I also think that this idea of colorblindness, right, then ends up being this way of coding, right, for race, right? So thinking of um, examples like in Brazil, which you can't do anymore, right? Boa apariencia, right? Good appearance, right? So that there might be a job ad, right, that we're looking right, for uh, like a retail worker, right, that has a good appearance. What does that mean? Okay. That means does not look black or indigenous. Right? That means looks right in, in terms of the codings right of of whiteness, which we also have right in the U.S. Right of what looks professional, right? or how meritocracy right gets coded right as white. Right, why are you here? Oh, this must be a diversity hire. Right, with thinking right, about how. Whiteness becomes normalized, okay? That becomes the, the default, okay? Whereas blackness okay, and racial mixture, okay, becomes the exception, okay? That they must be an exceptional, okay, in all these ways. Otherwise, okay, it's understood, right, as not deserving, okay? And I heard something interesting as well about these affirmative action debates right? it, within Latin America, right, as well as the U.S., right? This notion right, that it is whiteness that's under attack, 
right? <laughs> which right, I just find uh, very humorous, right? <laughs> like, okay, the idea of that whiteness is so fragile, despite being at the top of the hierarchy, right, that everything else right, is not valued, right? Shouldn't be there. Right? And that might be within institutions, right, or within popular culture, right? But we just couldn't find the right actress, so we need to put some heavy makeup right, on this right actress to make them look darker. We just couldn't find the right actress, right? That, right? You see how constantly, right, this um, idea of color blindness, especially as it coincides with racial mixing, because now that we have racial mixing. We don't have racism, so therefore, right, just as you mentioned, right, to talk about race becomes racist. Right? That it becomes this cycle, right, in which there's this continual disavowal, right, of blackness at the same time, right, that whiteness is able to maintain its power. Um, so, in said that, right, I'd also love to hear about this juxtaposition of the denial, right, of African heritage. At the same time that there's often an embrace of African heritage, right? especially in Latin America. Well, I think once again, this is a context in which the Americas align more than they differ. Right? Mm -hmm. um, so the, the, I'll use a US uh, example first, right? People love Beyonce. They love, love, love Beyonce. Mm -hmm. Um, but, and across the America, you know, however, that doesn't stop right? anti-black violence, right? that love of Beyonce, because she's viewed as an exception and staying in her lane. That is to say, where do we embrace and value blackness in cultural spaces? That's your lane, stay right there. It also is a bit of a narrow frame. You see what happens with this cow, this little country music album that she's got coming out, right? There's people in Texas are like, oh, I'm losing their minds, right? Um, see what the country music awards look like this coming year, right? Um, <laughs> maybe I'll tune in for the very first time. Uh, but in any case, the idea is when issues of anti-blackness get raised, right? You know, when hashtag Black Lives Matter occurs in Latin America as well. Right? The notion is, oh, but no, 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 no. We love black people. Ah, oh, Celia Cruz. Oh, the Beyonce. We love her so much. Oh, the shame that she has passed away. Right? That two things can exist at the same time, particularly where the love is stratified. The love is targeted only about staying in your lane. Music, athleticism, the physicality of black bodies right, in what they do, how they service the nation. Right? Not in their intellectual endeavors, not in their contributions to nation building, not as heroes, freedom fighters, liberators across the region. Right? That then is not love unconditionally. Right? Uh, it's a very specific kind of love, right? which any parent will tell you, right? If, if your parent only loves you when you're doing good, that doesn't feel particularly nice, right? You don't come home with the bad grades and, and what have you to a parent whose love is conditional in that way. You don't feel fully nurtured, sustained, right? Uh, and so this, I think, is part of the problematic way in which blackness is put in a particular kind of love box that in of itself shows anti-blackness. Yeah, thank you for that. I actually also love that you were talking about the family, right? Because often the interracial family, right, is heralded, right, as this end to racism or the very existence, right, of racially mixed peoples across the Americas, right, as proof, right, that racism does not exist, right? Because how could there be racism if there's this person here, right, that's racially ambiguous, right, i.e. Uh, not too dark, right, only within, there's, so there's also a very particular image, right, of who that ideal is, right, not too dark, um, only a certain kind of hair texture, 
pain, that that could be presented. But even within the family, right, it doesn't mean at all right, that there can't be racism right, and favoritism right, within the same family. Right? And that there can't be different levels of violence. Right? Again, we think about the sexual violence right, of colonization right, and enslavement. And that is not proof right, that there was not racism. Right? The whole system was race-based. And so of thinking about how blackness gets utilized right, in these particular moments as proof right, that what can't possibly be racist, right? As, you know, oh, I have I have a black friend, right? I once had a black coworker, right? I once had a neighbor that lived actually not near me, but I heard about because right? I to think about segregation, right? right? That once invited a black person over, right? And I didn't do anything. Right? Therefore, I could not be racist, right? Right? But absolutely, racism could also exist. I mean, within the family, even if we're thinking of these terms that seem innocuous, right? That um, of the ways that we talk about hair, right, or skin color within families, right? Who's considered, right, to be um, the good-looking one, right, or the pretty one, or the smart one, right? Often um, there's this favoritism that's very much based, right, upon color, right, and hair texture and phenotypical features, right. And at the same time, right, that blackness, right, as you mentioned, is part of the stay in your lane, right? There's very much, right, stay in your lane in terms of the physical, right, the cultural, also in the idea of the sexual, right, that maintain these tropes, right, of blackness is utilized only when it's in the service, actually, of whiteness itself, right? Right, to prop up whiteness, right? And to prop up, right, the juxtaposition, right, of whiteness against blackness and how racial mixture, right, becomes this intermediary, right, between the two, right? So that often, like, the idea of, of racial mixture, right, right, also often gets used as operators, right, as operators to maintain, right, the system of white supremacy. And when we do have, and I'm thinking of public figures, hey, right, like here in the US, like Colin Kaepernick, right? I'm like, oh, you're that kind of black guy? You're that kind of racially mixed black guy? <laughs> oh, okay. We didn't we didn't know that. Right? We thought you were gonna be like the um, like Derek Cheater, right? <laughs> you know, don't talk about it, right? That when right, race and racism does get called out, right, then the issue, as you mentioned, becomes, oh, you're the racist because you're talking about race. Right? You're causing a problem. You didn't stay in your lane. Right? So there's this simultaneous right, embrace of blackness at certain points, and particularly in terms of, of culture, sports. At the same time, there's this disavowal of blackness in these other sectors, as you mentioned. Um, so I'd love to hear, going off that, how more about how these racial hierarchies right, are operating on this either everyday level, in institutions, and other aspects of our culture. I will, but first, I just have to pick up on something you uh, threw out there because I was like, oh, I gotta elaborate a little bit more on this because it was just too, doom, doom, too rich. Right? It's about the rhetorics that are utilized. So, meaning this idea, like, oh, you know, because we have more racial mixing in Latin America. See, we have all these couples in interracial, you know, coupling, blah, blah. Uh, let's look at the facts on the ground. Right? First, there's the divide between who's the side piece. Right? And mm -hmm. who is the person you build your life with, or who you view mm -hmm. as, you know, a possibility for building your life with? Those are two different things, right? and they have a racial dynamic. You can easily fill in a blank. Right? The other thing is that when you look at those who get chosen to build your life with, right? for which there's some mixing, sociologists, when they pull out what they call la paleta, that is a skin shade chart and they do their little interviews and surveys and whatnot. This is what they find, that those so-called interracial couples actually look closer in skin shade than not. Right? That is to say, stark disparities in skin shade 
are not so frequent in Latin America or in the United States. Another level is these interviews, Achinieri Osuji, right? Her work, she interviews interracial couples in the US and in Latin America, Brazil in particular. Right? Mm -hmm. And what she discovers is that for those couples who've actually done the transatlantic, where they move back and forth, right? they've enabled with you know, their own um, professionalism to travel back and forth, they describe how they feel more uncomfortable in Latin America as an interracial couple with stark disparities in skin shape than they do in the United States, the evil United States that doesn't understand racial mixing. So I just have to put those kind of like facts on the table because otherwise it gets sort of like treated as, oh yeah, yeah, now what do we do? Huh? The other little fact too is studies of twins in families, huh? in Latin America in particular. Though, I wonder how much you would also see this in the US, well, let me bring this in a second. Twin studies, right? So, same family, same genetics, same year, maybe a minute or two apart, right? <laughs> Suppose you race out first, but mo they're twins. Studies of twins in Latin America show that the lighter one gets more family investment of resources and love and concern than the darker twin. Twins. This tracks then across their professional lives, if they are able to have professional lives. That is to say, their socioeconomic attainment differs, even though they're from the same family. So you would think, whatever the family's culture of like working hard, valuing education, etc., right? That we always use these ideas of blaming people, right, for not having achievement. Oh, the family, they didn't value education. Okay. Same family. Why these different trajectories? in a pattern, and right? if you study these, these twins over time, you see this. In the United States, we have the same skin shade barriers. Often when I raise this, I'm told, oh yeah, the black community, such a shame. They're so colorist with each other. Meaning, it's your own pathology, right? It's, it's on y'all, right? It's not about the system, structures, etc. However, if you look at the U.S. labor market, where the vast majority of employers are not black <laughs> of any part of the African diaspora, <laughs> the majority are still white men. <laughs> they are the ones who own companies, they are the ones who run companies, etc. And these white men hire along the spe color spectrum. They may not necessarily consciously understand what they're doing, but they do it often enough that there is a pigmentocracy in the U.S. labor market that is not just, again, about investment to returns and investment in education, et cetera. Okay, so I, just, I, I wanted to like prob problematize these ideas that kind of get put out there as if they're facts, when when you dig a little deeper, you see, no, that's a story. What's the actual, what are the actual facts on the ground? Okay, so how does this stuff show itself up in institutions and what have you. Well, I'll pick up on, right, the one about the labor market. We see that it's not inconsequential, right, this idea of skin shade, but also in treatment of racial mixture, right? So, looking just at the US, in an earlier book, I look at how employers treat mixed race employees and also in lots of other sectors, but let me I'll pull up the, the, the employment chapter. And what I found was that employees will come forward to court with stories about what happened to them. And what was fascinating were the stories over and over again, where the employer suspected or assumed that they were mixed race because they didn't look quite white, white. But they were okay with it. Employer didn't make any noise, didn't treat them any different than anybody else, etc. Dare I say, they look more like Keanu Reeves. That kind of mixed. You, you, you got something there, but all right. All right. <laughs> but when family members, the darker skinned family members, start showing up at the workplace, you know, meet you for lunch, give you a ride after work, drop you off to arrive at work, that kind of thing, right? You know, families, family, they help you out. When the dark skinned family members come in and they out you, then it shifts, right? Then the Jordan Peele kind of mix is identified 
and the employer is no longer so satisfied. They now start to discover, oh, your work product isn't as good as I thought it was. You mean there's black in the mix? I thought you were just some kind of like Latino with Italian or something like that. I mean, that part's okay. So it's not all mixing, right? It's particular contributions to the mix that are viewed as problematic. So this is within institutions, right? In systems, et cetera. We see the same within Latin America, right? It's not, um, you know, in the rhetoric of like, oh, racial mixing will solve all our problems. Right? It's also, oh, look at racial mixing and our acceptance of it. We love to, you know, <laughs> um, shows that we're not racist. But if you only like particular kind of visions of racial mixture, if you've got an image in your mind about what racial mixture looks like, and it doesn't include Jordan Peele, that's not then an, a proof right, that there's no racism. Sure, for things. Um, I just want to thank you right, for um, all of all the data, right? But also across uh, different different regions, right? And also these different anecdotes, right? Of thinking about how um, racial mixing right, actually often reinforces, right? <laughs> right? Anti-blackness right? and uh, and white supremacy. Uh, so, Paul, can you can you hear us, Paul? Is here? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so Paul, we just wanted to turn it over to you as well for your insights hey, coming from um, all the expertise and, and research that you've done on this topic. Well, thank you. And first of all, I want to say that um, I'm an enormous fan of both of your works. And I've learned so much from both of your, both of you as scholars. I'm just thrilled to be here. I'm very humble. Um, I also, hopefully when I'm in Brooklyn, I'll be able to get you to sign my uh, copies of your book. Um, and they, they just have, have taught it. I've learned so much and I'm incorporating your scholarship into my classes and organizing work even, even as we speak. Um, so, this has been a wonderful discussion. I've been taking a lot of notes as, you, as you've been talking, and I'm going to read a little bit from the notes. But, um, uh, Tom, you, you began by asking us to consider the overlapping histories of slavery, abolition, nation making, eugenics, and racial formation in the Americas. And I just wanted to kind of rip off of your, um, your historical thread and to kind of con uh, continue with this to share some experiences I've had in teaching and organizing along these themes during my career. Um, and this goes back to when I first began lecturing on the Mexican War of Independence uh, at UC Santa Cruz uh, when I was teaching a course back in the day called African American and Latino Histories. And during this lecture on the Mexican War of Independence, 1810 to 1821, um, I foregrounded the roles of African and indigenous peoples in the great achievement of Mexican independence from the Spanish Empire. Uh, the role of Afro-indigenous military leaders like Jose Marie Morelos, um, uh, many of these freedom fighters who suffered, who were tortured, who were killed by Spanish and European army sent to re-enslave them. Um, I went on in the, in the lectures to talk about the profound impact of the Mexican War of Independence on the United States and the great boom that our War of Independence had on the anti-slavery movement in the Americas in general. Now, as I was lecturing, I could tell there was a bit of discomfort in the room, um, but you know, these can be traumatic subjects, right? Um, and then during my office hours later that day, a group of women students, all of whom self-identified as Mexicanas, uh, walked into my office and were visibly upset. Uh, some were on the verge of tears. I could tell some had been crying. And I asked them what was wrong. And the response was, was incredibly educational and humbling to me. Because what they said was that, you know, uh, Professor Ortiz, we were all educated initially in Mexican schools. We have all celebrated Mexican Independence Day. But we were never told about the roles of African and indigenous peoples in the War of Independence against the Spanish Empire. We were never told that the Mexican War of Independence over time became a war against slavery just as much as it was a war 
or independence. And it was because of this invisibility of the black struggle for freedom in Mexico and in the United States and the Americas in general uh, that I decided to write an African American and Latinx history in the United States the way I wrote it. Because I realized that dealing with any kind of racism, especially anti-black racism, uh, would be impossible without understanding and sharing the central role that African descent people have played for liberation in the Americas. And I went through, I talked about the U.S. American Revolution. Again, to most children in this country, the achievements, the, the sacrifices that black people played during the U.S. American Revolution completely invisibilized, except for token sidebar stories about Christmas addicts, and even those are watered down. Um, the same invisibility of the black struggle during the U.S. Civil War. When I tell my students and when I tell my fellow union organizers that, that even Abraham Lincoln towards the end of the American Civil War said without the black struggle, without black contributions, uh, we would be talking about two different countries right now. It was black people that saved the United States of America from dissolving during the Civil War. Lincoln himself said that. Many of his generals said that. Black people knew that back then. Today, we've forgotten those lessons. And as long as we continue to ally black people and African descent people from our liberation narratives, we're going to continue to grapple with anti-black racism. It isn't the only, you know, the history is just one tool out of many, right? Um, but as long as we ally those black achievements and sacrifices, we're going to have um, anti-black racism in all of our respective diasporas. So two more briefer points to make. One is that I engage in, this, in these discussions with my students today at the University of Florida, and what makes these discussions challenging but necessary um, are that these are family discussions. And uh, Tanya and Jasmine, I know you both referenced Peary Thomas and your work down these mean streets. My students love that work. And again, down these mean streets pushes my students to tears because even though he wrote the book in the 60s, and it's a prison narrative, and it's a family narrative about anti-blackness within a Puerto Rican family, these are the same types of dynamics that my students from the Spanish Caribbean, from the French Caribbean, from Latin America deal with today. And we have these really, so if we have a, a discussion about black and brown solidarity at the University of Florida, it often begins with, well, you know, I'm the darkest skin member of my family. My mother's asked me to uh, use skin lightening uh, treatment. She's asked me to straighten my hair. Um, I don't want to do that any longer. I want to be who I, I want to be. And so we begin there with family discussions. And those are challenging. And, and I think that that's, that's what makes this discussion so necessary today. It's historical. It's personal. And, and, and again, I'll conclude by, by this um, uh, stopping where I started, uh, just maximum respect to the work that both of you are doing in making these very personal discussions and giving us a social context to be able to discuss these things uh, and bring them out into the open. Because, yes, we too often hide them. We, we have this understanding among Latinos in the United States, uh, and, and as an organizer, I've seen this over and over again, where we say that, you know, we're not like the Anglos. Uh, we don't have the racism problems like the Anglos have. And I've heard that as an organizer in the labor movement, but it's just not true. Um, it, it's a challenging uh, truth to deal with, but once we deal with it, we become better organizers, we become better teachers, we become better neighbors, we become better parents, uh, we become, become better scholars. So thank you for really uh, 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 leading this robust discussion. Well, it's such a pleasure to meet you virtually, <laughs> um, and that I can give you this personal thank you. Um, Dr. Ortiz was very uh, supportive of my work as it was being developed. Um, I don't think that was supposed to be an anonymous uh, review. Anyway, <laughs> it was formative in getting the book done. Let's just put it that way, and I thank you for that. Um, 
Uh, the other thing that I wanted to just um, bring out is that oftentimes when I speak in primary Latino, Latinx, Latine audiences, students will say to me, this in my family, how do I have this conversation? I wish my mom or my grandma or whomever could read your book, but they are Spanish language readers. Right? Mm -hmm. um, and it's for that reason right, that I fought, fought, fought to get the book uh, translated to Spanish. And so the Spanish version will be coming out in August. Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. Maybe one day we'll come back, we'll have a discussion about the racial politics of publishing. Um, it was a whole journey. Um, but in any case, um, you know, this idea of not everyone's going to be a scholar of race, but they care about these issues very much from a societal perspective, and they also want to be able to make a difference even within their families, right? Because family builds family, builds family, right? Builds a nation. Um, and so this idea of becoming, you know, as Dr. Ortiz says, racially literate, you know, what that, that's what the historians are trying to do for us, right? um, to help us be racially literate, to not lose and have the erasure right, of our contributions uh, across different um, racial backgrounds. And so um, I'm so glad to be in the room with all of, all of you and, and, and with, these three, with these two other amazing scholars. Yeah, thank you. And really, I, I love how both of you really highlighted this need to, to learn our histories, right? to, in many ways, unlearn right, the histories right, that we've been taught, right, that uh, the U.S. was a, a, a white nation, that uh, we once had indigenous people, right? and it was like, they're still here, right? we're, we're, we're still here. Um, and there was this you know, segregation and things got better, like this idea of like this march towards progress, right? That we're really attached to, right? That we're, we're marching towards progress. Um, and then thinking that along the lines within Latin America as well, and how this um, idea of the march towards progress, but we're trying to progress towards what, right? That's really the question I have, right? What are we trying to progress towards? And is that a vision, right, that we want to be a part of? And much of that is going to be about learning those histories, right? So whether it be, I was just thinking of my eight-year-old son who was talking about the Alamo, and said, what's the Mexican perspective, right? <laughs> like, we're talking about Davy Crockett. I was like, well, they came because they, they didn't want to have Texas deaf slavery. Oh, <laughs> okay, now why don't we talk about that, right? But that should be me, that should be, that should be the default, right? So which perspectives are we not including because we're tethered to this idea Right, that we're getting better, and that therefore we don't need to talk about these issues anymore. And that's why I think there's so much of this uproar okay, that we have in the US, but also in the Americas as a whole, over a denial of history, of not wanting to teach okay, certain ideas and certain subjects, because that's dangerous, right? That endangers this narrative Right, of who we are. Right? So what I would love to talk about is who do we want to be? Well, I mean, if Dr. Fiss was joining in this as well, but it seems to me it's also, what are we thinking of as progress, right? Progress meaning, oh, racial mixture gives us progress? Well, that sounds like it's because you don't want to have political institutions, civil rights, laws, anti-discrimination efforts being deployed to actually transform a society to be truly egalitarian. That is to say, you want the racial mixture to do all the work, you don't want institutions and politics and government to be involved whatsoever. Um, and it seems to me that idea of progress is a very empty one, right? Okay, well, you know, maybe the population looks a different kind of way, or looks exactly the same, but you call it not something different, right? Um, and yet, the lack of true inclusion and um, meaningful participation in our society and in all levels of the economy, that remains stagnant? It's a, you know, what, what kind of progress is that? I think we should go to questions, but before, but very briefly, Paul, because we were talking about the kind of uproar about the ability of historians to make us racially literate, and you're living in the middle of this uproar. So I'm wondering if you could just quickly comment on what it's like to be in the middle of that uproar.
sophomore, and then we'll take questions and answers from the audience. Yeah, thank, thank you, Gaston, and, and thank you for, and, and the whole crew at Brooklyn College for organizing this, this amazing event. Like I said, I'm continuing to take notes and continue to learn uh, so many things. But yeah, it's really challenging in states like Florida, states like Texas, and, and Florida, as many of you know, um, we can't even talk about topics like this in our K through 12 public schools any, any longer. Um, we cannot, you know, I have a lot of colleagues, even in higher education, in our universities and colleges, who now routinely shy away from even assigning books by people like Tony Morrison, people like Terry Thomas, uh, people like Nunez Diaz, uh, and it really breaks my heart to be in this in this kind of environment. On the same time, I'm happy to, to report that more younger people and more communities are are having these conversations, but they're taking them outside into different types of spaces. And they're saying that if we can't have these conversations like the one we're having right now at Brooklyn College, let's do it at a community center. Mm -hmm. Um, let's do it at a, a church or a mosque or synagogue or a union hall. And so that's where a lot of these conversations are having now, are, are taking place right now. And it's very interesting to see groups like, say, the South Florida People of Color or the Coalition of Immokalee Workers, the Farm Worker Association <clears throat> of, of Florida, or even my union, United, uh, 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 UFF, United Faculty of Florida, having these very challenging discussions. The reason it's important is because we're trying to organize in such a way that we can overturn the reactionary, the fascist trend in politics uh, in states like Florida. And unless we can deal with anti-black racism, we're not going to be able to overturn that fascist trend, very frankly. So this becomes both a question of humanity, of, of the dignity of each individual, and it also is a political question because racism is used in Florida very instrumentally to divide and to conquer our different groups or different peoples or different genders or different classes. Um, and this is why we have the anti-woke laws. This is why the state understands very clearly it needs to stop any types of discussions about systemic racism, about sexism, uh, about transphobia. And the state of Florida and Governor DeSantis understands that he can only stay in power as long as he keeps us disempowered. And we will be disempowered as long as we allow sexism and racism and, and other forms of oppression to continue. This is why this discussion is so very important. Thank you, Paul. Um, can I open it up for questions from the audience? And I'll do over. <laughs> Thank you all for the um, wonderful conversation. I guess I'm just thinking about, um, I've been going back and forth on um, reparations for a, quite a while. And I think your conversation today actually is give, giving me some sense of, I need to be bolder in how I think about reparations in that reparations, I think, is potentially the conversation that has us address the Americas as a whole, particularly aimed at Europe, and help us get beyond this idea of the nation, in which we're talking about imperialism, and these nations of the Americas are really just the outgrowth of imperialism in the form of colonialism, you know, genocide, all these different things. And so how might reparations be a more global conversation situated in the Americas that get us beyond this question of the nation state where all these isms are baked in. I'll take a quick first step and then in front of you all are getting jumping. Um, it's for this reason that I am often very disheartened by the divisions within the reparation movement. Mm -hmm. You know, organizing is a, always a tough slog and I'll let Dr. Ortiz fill in the um, details, but within reparations, right, to be overly simplistic, there's the pan-Africanist perspective, right, that directly speaks to this idea of an African diaspora, right, 
that has suffered of colonialism right, uh, across geographic spaces. Um, and thus, reparations means dealing with that complexity just like the complexity of the slave trade. Right? Um, whereas sort of the alternative view is this idea in the United States that reparations is just about the US, mm -hmm. and reparations is just about, um, do you remember how Adolf puts it? Descendants of, of, of US slavery. In other words, what gets sometimes put down to blackity blacks, right? You know, this idea of only English speaking African Americans, not nobody with no West Indian ancestors, right? You know, the ju just US South, as if the US South also was a monolith, right? Um, and here's where I kind of my thinking uh, goes on all of this. One, I find that division very disheartening, right? But I also think we need to respect the ways in which the African American situation in the United States is one that is a constant history of other isms being utilized as a distraction from attending to the anti-blackness against African Americans, right? Meaning, if you think of um, blackness and anti-blackness as always having a vision of who's the real black person, mm -hmm. right? Than the real black person, it's almost not even Africans anymore, right? It's just US African Americans. Um, and so I think that those nuances are ones that we can handle, but instead we shy away from them and think of it as being too complicated, too dangerous, etc. Um, it's the same thing that tells us we can't think about uh, organizing in intersectional ways. Intersectional, not just across gender and class and what have you, but within um, the intersection as within what even we think of as a, a monolithic group. And I'll just give a quick example. Right? Recently, New York Times came out with this article, more Latinos are going for Trump. Okay? Ooh, this is dangerous. The Latino voter is becoming polar, right? you know, more and more embracing Trump and not in spite of right, his anti-immigrant, anti-everything um, stance, but because of it. That's is what is attracting Latinos, right? Okay, I'm not saying there's no truth in any of this, but what was disturbing to me about the article right, is that it completely makes Latinos a monolith. Mm -hmm. All Latinos think this, right? It, compl it just completely ignores and takes away the Afro-Latino voter that doesn't vote like that, that doesn't poll that way. The lack of intersectionality about Latinos, Latinx, Latine, right, means that you miss the anti-blackness within Latinidad. Right? Uh, and so these are nuances we can handle, right? but they get erased. Right? And so I think similarly with regards to the, the, the reparations debates. I should love to hear from Paul. No, I'll just say very kind of simply, right? I love this idea of the global approach. And I think it often gets mired down like in so many different policies, like affirmative action, right? Quotas in Latin America. Well, who qualifies as black? Well, because we can't decide that, we just can't do this, right? And so it gets mired down often into this um, idea of identity politics that actually presents blackness as the problem, right? That well, it's, it's, it's the black community that's the problem because they can't decide among themselves and therefore we can't have this policy, right? And so I think, right, you're saying we, that there's often this idea that we can't handle the nuances, right? And thinking of blackness also as this political identity, right, this historical and political identity, right, towards this end of, of justice, right, that is very much transnational. Paul, I don't know if you want to jump in or... Um, thank you so much for, for being here and for this great conversation. I was wondering if you could tease out Latin America a little bit more, right? Because not all of Latin America is the same and there are real right distinctions. I'm from Chile, which has its own brand of whiteness, right? And one of the things that has played out recently is in this um, constitutional reform and uh, 
in the first one, not the second one, uh, but in the first one, there was this idea of getting indigenous people a seat at the table, right? Included, not included in that what were Afro-Chilenos, right? Who were not even acknowledged, right? I mean, as, as late as the year 2000, the president of Chile was like, there was no slavery in Chile because it was too cold here, right? I mean, how wild, right? So Afro-Chilenos were not, you know, kind of legally recognized until 2020. And then they were not included at the table in this constitutional, right? And when, when the Afro-Chilean community went to the 13 indigenous groups, right, and were, and were like, help us out here, those groups were like, mm, hard pass, like, we support you, but not publicly, because we, we need to make sure that our people are, you know, get, get their spots, right? So it plays out internally in Chile, but then the way that Chile is perceived by the rest of Latin America, right, and, and uh, how that plays out, right, that Brazil, Colombia, Cuba are the, the lands of racial mixing, Whereas there are some countries in Latin America that are, are, are too far gone or have already reached the promised land, right? So you could tease that out a little bit more. Thanks. Yes, Latin America is so fascinating, right? Um, and, and, and here's the thing. When I first started on the project of like, you know, and, and, and that's when I met Dr. Mitchell, she was like, oh, what are you doing? Um, started on this project of like looking at the region as a whole, right? and including the Caribbean, um, I was constantly confronted with it. You know, I'm a lawyer by training, so I deal with you know, representatives of nation states and, and what have you. Um, and I would be confronted with nation state members saying things like, oh, you know, there's too many differences. Cuba is not Argentina. Argentina is not Ecuador. Ecuador is not Uruguay, and so on and so forth, right? And yes, that's true. And right? that is to say, Alabama is not upstate New York. Yeah. <laughs> it's not Mississippi. It's not Alaska, right? However, right? it doesn't mean you can't talk about U.S. anti-blackness, right? So in looking at the region and its specificities, I, what I always was sort of putting forth is, yes, but what is important is to not lose sight of a commonality, a parallel of anti-blackness. Right? So it, it, what's so fascinating is that when you talk about these things in the region, people always say, oh, yes, southern cone racism. It ain't like any other. Right? You know what I mean? Like, um, <laughs> and, and here's the thing. Let's pull Argentina out of the hat for the moment. Right? In Argentina, People have this notion of like, well, we have blacks, but you know that's because now we have immigration. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, oh yeah, we got blacks, but you know they're the ones from Brazil. <laughs> yeah, right. it's blackness is always someplace else, right? And has nothing to do with your own nation state, right? Completely erasing, right? Blackness is viewed as a historic past. Right? When at one point in the 1920s, let's take a city, Buenos Aires, people of African descent on the census counted as a majority, right? A significant number. Right? Would they all disappear? Argentina would have you believe that that was the case, right? Oh, they disappeared because then the census stopped counting and so you know that we don't see them anymore, right? So there was census politics that made them be invisible. There was also immigration. Oh, let's open the doors to the European immigrants because we need the right kind of immigrants, right? It's called a whitening process, a blanqueamiento, right? And so with those trajectories, what it means is that present day visibility of blackness is explained by something else. This also came up in Mexico as well, right? Where when people were, uh, Christina Su, you know, started interviewing people, you know, what do you think of these dark skinned people walking down the street or whatever? Yeah? Well, that's only in Veracruz. It's nowhere else. And, and well, what, where do these black people in Veracruz come from? Right? Well, there was a US, ship, I think, that, you know, had a shipwreck, and then those people, right, meaning it has nothing to do with the colonial Spaniard right, bringing ships of enslaved Africans right, to Mexico. So that is to say, yes, there's particularities, and there's a way in which there is a re-imagination, right, of the past 
that complete and, and makes blackness a historic past uh, that has nothing to do with the present. Um, and it makes it not only the people are racially illiterate, they are completely devoid of any understanding of these sort of things that actually do explain what they're seeing. Right? Or like, why is this photograph from the past show such a dark skinned, curly haired member of the family? Oh, it must be the way they developed film back then, right? It's always some other explanation. <laughs> We have time for one more question, and then remember that at the end, we will be passing out uh, free uh, copies of the books for uh, the students. And you had your hand up before. Yes, then we will do. Thank you again for being here. I had a question or just a comment. For those individuals, black and brown, that have to be exceptionally better, right? Overcome all the, um, the racism and stuff like that, and they have to be exceptionally better, and still face intersectionality. What is the approach that you? What's the solution to that? What's the approach that you have to do? Because you, you, you go to school, you go to trainings, you get the jobs. However, you plateau at one point. Mm -hmm. and you can't go over. So how do you approach that? And we can be quick on the answer, but I want to make sure we get one more student question in. Um, I, I think I might want to throw this over to Dr. Ortiz, but my quick um, response is that we need to hold accountable those who say they represent us, right? Meaning each individual just trying to go to work, pay bills, et cetera, right? But we have organizations, politicians, so-and-so uh, that are supposedly uh, people who we vote into office or otherwise look to our, our churches, our community organizers, et cetera. We need to hold them accountable to, to, to be intersectional. Meaning don't tell me, oh, first we do black liberation, then we deal with trans rights as if black trans rights are not a thing, right? No, we have to attend to it all because within the one thing you're talking about, blackness, there are intersections. Dr. Ortiz, would you like to respond? Well, do you want to respond or? Well, I agree 100%. And I think that, you know, one of the things we, is we need to hold leaders accountable, our organizations or, uh, and each other and also we should learn from the fact that our, our enemies, people who want to keep us oppressed, people passing these anti-woke laws, passing these anti-labor laws, uh, trying to stop the votes uh, of African-Americans and Latinos and oppressing uh, immigrant workers, uh, they hate this term intersectionality, by the way, and they're trying to expunge it, and that's very instructive for us. We need to double down and emphasize the connection uh, connections between each other, um, the tensions, yes, uh, the failures to connect, the the, the, the problems, the, the discrimination, but also the efforts of coalition building. And again, I'll say that in Florida, we're not even supposed to use the term intersectionality. And again, that's very instructive. The people, the powers that be, want us to want us to view ourselves as separated from each other, uh, as isolated, alienated individuals. We need to learn how to get together again uh, and, 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 and build on the great work that has been talked about today at this, this wonderful session. Thank you. We have one final question or comment. Um, thank you for this conversation. Like, my friends and I have these conversations about the Caribbean all the time. But um, my question is basically, being as racial mixing is supposed to kind of like eliminate racism to a certain extent. What's to stop it to becoming sort of like the caste system in India and basically separating people based off that or resurgence of a new of well resurgence of racism based off of what somebody is mixed with? Quite honestly, I think we've already had that, right? <laughs> to be honest, like that's I mean literally we and we've had right these colonial, right? Uh, Costa system, right, in which there's this categorization, right, of who is more valued or not, right, based upon right what they're mixed with, right, and I think at the root, right, is often this idea of anti-blackness, right, and then we also take the gender in, right, but we've kind of escorted uh, gender in the conversation, right, but the the gendered component, right, of what the vision is of the kind of ideal racially mixed nation, it's almost always a woman, right? The kind of idea of the woman as the reproducer of the nation, right, and the future of the nation that will get whiter and whiter. And the question right, that I have is who gets left behind? 
right? And what do they look like, right? And I think we have a feel like, I, we, we can already imagine, right, what they look like, right? It's the darker, right? So I think we have this um, pseudo caste system, right, actually already in place, right? Whether that be in Hollywood, right, in terms of casting, right, right that are, right, um, as Professor Arnett does, right, we talked about it in the job market and the labor market. So I think we're actually seeing this play out, right, right in front of us. And I think the important thing to do, right, is to be very suspicious of these kinds of sort of stories, right? Um, or, you know, oh, such a pretty baby, right? So mixed, because it makes, you know, oh, or like, you know, when a duration get, a couple gets together, like, oh, the baby's going to be so beautiful, mm -hmm. right? Um, the idea here being, right, it's part of this notion, right, of improvement and that there's problems with uh, the, the other contributions. Um, now, how do we reject all that? I say this, we need to be very upfront about it. Right? This idea of, oh, it's, you know, impolite, right? you know, to call it out. No, no, no. What, we're gonna let blood spill in the street because we wanna be polite? No, I, I don't agree with that. Thank you so much. Paul, any final comments or questions uh, from you? Just a second, I got to uh, unmute myself. Um, I just want to encourage everyone here to continue the discussion um, and to really take to heart um, what uh, Destin and uh, I have been uh, trying to share with us today. Um, we need to continue this dialogue. We need to have this dialogue uh, in our classrooms, in our communities, in our organizing centers, um, and, and with our families. Um, it's, this, it's more important than ever to continue this kind of discussion because we are raised, uh, facing a rising tide of fascism in this country. And so these questions are at the center of being able to counter that authoritarian trend uh, in our politics. And so I just want to thank you for inviting me to participate. I greatly look forward to being with you all in person. Uh, Tommy and Jasmine, I hope you have a chance to, to talk and, and, and do some chisme at least uh, uh, in April. Uh, just so looking forward to being back in Brooklyn. Because Brooklyn is where it's at. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Paul. Uh, thank you so much, Jasmine. I'm so glad that you joined our faculty. Tommy, you are always welcome back to Brooklyn College. Uh, Paul, I'll see you in 10 days right here at the Tanger Auditorium. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here today. And remember, we've got free books afterwards. Thank you so much. <laughs> 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 My situation, there we go. <laughs>